Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this video, I wanted to satisfy a little intellectual curiosity I had, and maybe you've had it too. I want to answer the question, where is this page getting its data for view in the XAML Designer? And then I also want to, at the very end of this lesson, give you a word of encouragement since we're already a couple hours into this and I'm sure your head is spinning right now with all the new information that I've been throwing at you. Okay, so we understand from the previous lesson how the sample data is being populated at runtime. How it's being populated at design time is another matter entirely. How is it that we see data right now? We wouldn't expect the load state that we learned about in the previous lesson. We wouldn't expect this code to execute inside of the IDE. So we expect something else to be at work here, right? So let's take a look at our collection view source, right? And we noticed previously that the source attribute is being set to groups that is being bound into the default view model as we just looked at in the partial uh, class version of this page. But if you look down below it, there's another source attribute and it has a letter D colon in front of it. And there's a lot going on here, but let me simplify this by pointing you to the pages definition here at the very top where we have all these XML namespaces defined, right? And there's these two that are near the bottom that I wanna focus on. What this is doing is first of all, declaring uh, namespace mappings, and we already said this is just a form of identifying the rules or the contract that elements uh, given these prefixes adhere to. This tips off the XAML parser as to how to handle these namespaces, specifically the D namespace and the MC namespace. We'll start with the MC namespace because it's used in the very next line, this MC ignorable equal D. Here, this namespace and this ignorable attribute is invoking the OpenOffice XML file format specification and it's used to create compatibility between the different uses for the exact same XML document. So in this case, the XAML could be used by Microsoft Visual Studio and Microsoft uh, Expression Blend for designing the user interface. But then the XAML, the XML, could also ultimately be used by the XAML parser to create intermediate language code for use by the compiler. So we have two purposes, a design time use and a runtime use. So to make that XAML compatible for both uses, we have the MC namespace, and it defines some rules that makes this possible. Uh, and it has this one attribute in particular, particular, the ignorable attribute. And so it sets the ignorable attribute to the D colon, which we see here defined above it. It's pointing to that expression blend 2008 namespace. So this basically means that any attribute that begins with the namespace prefix of D is only there for designer support. So that final line here in our collection view source, this will all, this, this source attribute will be ignored when the app is executed and at runtime, all right? But while we're looking at Visual Studio, in design time, it provides real fake data so that we're not just looking at an empty page filled with nothing, right? So again, if you see the D prefix anywhere on the rest of this or any other page where D is set to this expression blend 2008 uh, namespace, it has been set as ignorable through the use of this contract, this namespace. All right? So we've established that it's fake, but yet it's still data and it's getting it from somewhere, right? So let's take a look at it a little bit more closely here. The D source equals a binding, a dynamic binding to all groups. And then there's some other attributes that are set here where the source is equal to, again here, D, a design instance of type sample data source. Now, where have we heard that before? That's right, the previous lesson. It's what gives us all of that fake sample data. It's hard-coded right there in the constructor of that class. All right, and it says, is design time creatable equals true? That means, can I go ahead and use this in the designer? 
absolutely it's set to true all right so again it's just saying that for design time, get the data from a collection of data called all groups. And to get data into all groups, the designer will need to create an instance of the sample data source. And we've already looked at sample data source and it's all groups collection. Uh, we could look at it again. I'm not sure that that's all that helpful for us here. Uh, let's see, where was it again? Uh, oh yeah, here. There we go, all groups. And we populate all groups in the constructor for the sample data source by adding groups and items like so, okay? Now, if we take a look at this collection, we haven't really addressed it very much. All groups is of type observable collection of T or of sample data group in this instance. All groups is bound to at design time. It has all the groups and the related items and Visual Studio sees the attributes to be used at design time. And it does all the behind the scenes magic to give us this live fake data experience in the XAML designer. And that my friends is how you load real fake data at design time. Okay. Uh, and I want to come back to this observable collection. I had a notion to talk about it now. Let me pause that uh, two videos from now. We'll talk about this at length. Okay. So again, my, I'm tempted, but we'll put that on pause. All right, so as we wrap up this lesson, I promised you some encouragement. And so here it goes. It would be easy to let yourself become really discouraged. There's a lot of new information coming at you very quickly, I understand. This might seem like blasphemy to some people who might be watching this, but you don't have to understand every single idea, every collection, every method inside of, the, of a project template before you get started. You just need to know where to poke around and what you should be leaving alone, all right? And you should make small changes, one or two lines of, of, of code, and then test it to see how it affects your project. If you get into this cycle of writing a little code, then testing that, and then writing a little code and testing it to see how it worked, you couldn't possibly have broken it beyond repair. You just need to hit uh, a control Z, control Z, control C to back out of those changes, all right? Uh, so keep the changes small and test, test, test. Now, later on in your programming career, you might want to learn more about this idea of unit testing and even an idea called test-driven development to build confidence in the code that you're writing. You write the tests for the code before you write the code itself, all right? It's a new way of thinking about writing software and it's becoming extremely popular and I, I want to push you in that direction when you're ready. Uh, but for now, just take tiny baby steps whenever you write code and keep things simple. So keep your chin up. You're doing great. Just hang in there. The longer you stare at a problem, the more it'll make sense. The longer it, that you stare at these collections and these classes and the comments and you start investigating and you, you know, dive into things like we've done here where we've, uh, in the past have, you know, right clicked and selected go to definition and things of that nature. The more time you spend investigating and researching, the more obvious this stuff will become. I promise you. All right. So in the next lesson, we're going to go ahead and add the recipe data store.cs to our app. Uh, but we're not done talking about the data source classes and how they work. We still need to talk about these collections. Like I said a moment ago, observable collection of T and what exactly is change notification that we talked about in the previous lesson. And so we'll address that after we add in our recipe data source and get it working. All right. So we'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you. Mm -hmm.